Well, welcome everybody. I mean, I'm delighted to be here and hope that Brian will be back soon because I think he can give some really nice context to this discussion. Uh, as a brief introduction though, I guess the idea for this webinar, the idea for this um, panel discussion um, came out of the, the notion of the European Science Festival and the work that many of us do in researching and studying and talking about science communication. So bringing those things together to ask, what is the landscape of European science communication? What do we know about it? And how is it changing, um, particularly in the impacts of this kind of tumultuous last couple of years uh, we've been through? So what we want to do um, is simply have a discussion around that based on the different research projects that we're involved in uh, and our own experiences as people spread across Europe and indeed the world uh, in thinking about uh, the practice and process and nature of science communication today. So the first question that I want to uh, kick the discussion off with and invite the, the different panelists to speak to is essentially um, what is this landscape of uh, science communication in Europe? How would you characterize it? Uh, and that might be based on research that you've been involved in. It might also be based on your own experiences uh, or intuitions. And I actually thought um, in answering this first question, we would move from uh, the South to the North. Um, and perhaps start with um, a perspective from outside Europe. Um, so Bankala, you were sitting in South Africa. Um, if we think about this question, uh, what is the landscape of science communication in Europe? Um, how would you choose to characterize it? Or how is it talked about or discussed in the context um, that you work in? Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, having studied in, in Europe, uh, as an outsider who has studied in Europe and been working with Europeans for a while, what I've seen is this very large picture of uh, science communication itself and then different debates going on in specific fields. And what we have seen today is with particularly with the uh, pandemic is that you cannot separate the two. The, the two have to go together. Uh, people must know about the process the, and how you get to the product. People must be able to uh, understand debates among scientists, how the uh, process goes, how, the, uh, how things evolve over time. And uh, essentially that has been the, the, the debate in Europe. And I hope at the end of this, we will come back stronger and be able to refine our, uh, that Europeans can refine this strategy a bit, that, uh, because we're still seeing very high levels of uh, uh, resistance in, in some states, uh, more than others, and still not so much now about the science, but understanding the, the, the process, and the social, psychological, and cultural uh, uh, perspectives we bring into uh, understanding science. Thank you. I think this is a great, this is something we'll come back to actually thinking about um, what, if anything, is distinctive about this European context that we're talking about. And it certainly sounds like there are many resonances and, and similarities um, uh, for, for, yeah, for South Africa, at least. Okay, so we move uh, northwards. I think, Anna, um, you would be next in that geography. Yes, I think so. We call ourselves the south of the north, so I think it's 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 good to start here. And actually, I can speak from the experience of Concise that we did find a very diverse landscape of science, but since our partners only came from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, which are countries which are not very well covered in most studies about science communication. I think we were, we were able to draw interesting insights. And one of the things that really, I wouldn't say surprised me, but I think it was very noticeable, was that whereas the Southern countries, in this case, Portugal, Spain, and Italy, had a very vibrant science communication community, with master degrees and training and professionals and well, some semblance of a career and uh, associations and all that and a lot of activities and diversity. 
our partners from the east, in this case Poland and uh, Slovakia, were in a completely different situation. They couldn't, almost couldn't be talked about science communication. People were interested in science. People were active in receiving science information from the usual means, journalism and uh, social media. But there was no science communication as we understand it now in our countries. It was quite surprising. There's barely any activity in museums and research centers. And so that was one of the, the, the key issues that I think that came out from the concise project within its internal workings, because the results we have obtained in terms of communicating with the public and uh, trying to understand what the public wanted from science communication, there we saw more commonalities than differences because people's relations to science after at the end of the day are not as distinct as they should be. Of course, we found some differences like more trust in universities in Southern Europe and less trust in Eastern Europe or in these two countries of Eastern Europe because it's always difficult to make very broad generalizations with a, a diverse block like Eastern Europe. But we did find some subtle differences between the approach to the role of business companies, for instance, and so it's an interesting uh, input that these European projects bring is to understand that while Europe has a lot in common and probably very different from what happens in South Africa or in Asia, there are significant differences in the European landscape of science communication. And they sh so we, we cannot think that one size fits all or one solution fits all. And we do have to take in consideration the, the context specificities of science society relations in each country. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is perhaps something that will um, Ako might mention because I know this was also something that came out of an, uh, the Quest project as another European project. I think as you were speaking, I was also thinking this is one of the, the valuable aspects of these kinds of bring together people from yeah, diverse contexts um, and kind of force us to realize that the things that we take for granted, um, for instance, you mentioned in the South, there is this kind of bustling community of courses and, and trainings. So the things that we take for granted are not actually present or um, even imaginable uh, in, in other places. Um, before we move on, actually, Anna, could you say a few words about the Concise Project? Because I think Brian was going to speak a little bit about the different European projects we were planning um, uh, on kind of drawing from. Um, uh, we could actually see Brian, are you back? No. Okay, but then we perhaps just introduce these projects briefly. Anna, maybe you could say a bit about Concise specifically. Okay, so Concise was a research project funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 program, uh, under the specific topic of science with and for society. So it brought together partners from five countries the coordinators in Spain, the University of Valencia, and then ourselves in Portugal, the University of Łódź in Poland, the University of Travna in Slovenia, Slovakia, sorry, always can mix two of them, and also Observa in Italy. And the core, although we did other tasks and other uh, research concerning the landscape of science communication in Europe with workshops with science communicators, the core activity of our projects were public consultations with citizens from the five countries in which we asked them what were their perceptions towards science communication and their suggestions to improve science communication on four scientific top hot topics, climate change, vaccines, GMOs, and alternative medicine. And so that was the, the main point was to ask people and to, to draw their uh, opinions on science communication, which I think is quite innovative because we do a lot of work on communicators and not on the audiences of science communication. And so and we did this and we finished the project almost one year ago. And so we're publishing now the results and we already did the research briefs and policy briefs. So all the information is available online and it's quite easy to find if you're curious. 
Yes, I should say that I think all the projects we will mention um, are access, you know, have websites with uh, publications and things. So um, you can Google Concise Project uh, EU. I'm pretty sure that will find it. Really interesting, Anna, that you mentioned that in the citizen discussions, there were many similarities that people had kind of um, at least relatively similar relations or ideas about science communication uh, and science. And it was actually the landscape of the science communication practices and structures um, that looked different. Um, so let's move um, to Germany. Um, actually, uh, Arko, you'll have to correct me if my geography is really out of order and Estonia is further south, but I, I don't think it is, right? Um, uh, yeah, so Birte, um, going back to this question, how would we characterize the landscape of European science communication? What would you say in answer to that? Yeah, thank you. I hope you hear me. Um, great. Very good. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks also for the question. And also thanks, Anna, for your response, because I think I can just uh, agree or I just agree with many things that you found out in your project. So I was involved in Rethink, another project that, that was fun, funded in this framework um, of Horizon 2020, Science Within Poor Society. And um, we focus on a kind of comparable question. So our question was how actually the, the landscape of science communication is changing, especially in the context of the digital transformation of public communication. Um, and we took a bit different approach than the colleagues from Concise and also from Quest. Uh, so we had different work packages that really did research. So uh, that was focused on quality. So how quality of science communication is changing, also how education is changing. Uh, we focused on sense making that is something that uh, copes quite nicely with what with, with, with what Anna just presented so the question how does the audience actually respond to science and science communication um, and we also uh, uh, had a look at researchers and their their perspectives on science communication um, and what we then did because as some of you might know all these projects that uh, um, have been funded in this in this framework have a very strong focus on a research practice interaction so there's a strong emphasis on on outreach and um, also science communication of science communication research uh, so what we also did is uh, that we uh, work with um, the practice uh, the um, practice community the professional field of science communication in different countries um, also in southern european countries especially in portugal and italy but um, in, in Western European countries, so basically UK and uh, the Netherlands, North Europe, Sweden, and we had also partners from Serbia and Poland involved. Um, and then we came to a very, very um, comparable observation to what Anne just, Anna just uh, reported, that there are very strong differences between the, the landscape in especially UK, Netherlands, Sweden, Germany, um, and also Italy, Portugal, uh, who have a, a tiny bit different approach, probably due to uh, cultural and, and language issues. Um, and then we have this, um, yeah, the field in the, in the Eastern European countries, uh, who, uh, which have a very, very uh, low history or low, uh, weak history. Can you, can you say weak history? I don't know if this is a right English term. I hope you understand what I mean. So they, they just uh, started with science communication in the last year. So they have a very, uh, they, they try to observe what's going on in the, in the Western field and also uh, e are very eager for exchange and also um, yeah, are, are very open, but uh, overall the, the a field is very, very under underdeveloped from a Western perspective. So that is uh, uh, maybe maybe a good a good way to explain it. Yeah, so that is basically what we what we experienced uh, during the last three years. Thanks, Birte. I, I think it's nice to to again emphasize this diversity, um, and also perhaps to pull out some of the differences in what we actually mean when we talk about science communication, because of course there's the citizen's perspective, how citizens relate to and think about science. There's the practitioner's perspective and the kind of different infrastructures and investment in science communication practice. You also mentioned research and researchers um, as a, a, a kind of an additional layer of this science communication landscape. So people like us essentially, who are often working in universities or research organizations, 
who are studying and thinking about science communication. And I think uh, um, both, all of these, these layers are interesting to think about and also interesting to think about is how they relate to each other. Um, so overcoming this, this perhaps um, gap between research and practice that still exists in, in many cases, in many contexts at least. Um, yes, Akko, let's move to Estonia. Yes, so uh, I'm representing the, the, the Quest uh, project, uh, one of the three projects uh, that started together and then looked at science communication in Europe. And our approach was more to think about what is uh, quality science communication, how to define it, how to e evaluate it. And then we were working a lot with science communication stakeholders in this project. Uh, so researchers, uh, journalists, uh, science communication professionals, science decision makers, also members uh, of, the, of the public. And then our focus was on three strands of science communication. So uh, journalism, social media and, and museums and trying to see whether there is kind of this overarching framework of, of quality that might apply to, to, to all of them. And and we built on that also a number of, of tools that could help to support quality in science communication. But we also started with mapping this European landscape, and this is actually uh, something that, that, that Sarah was, was leading in, in the project. And, and the outcome, reflecting on what, what Anna and Pirta has, has also said, is, is diversity. And you can, you can look at it from two sides, so from the positive side, we, we can agree that diversity is, is a value. So this is what European Union is, is built upon, that, that we have this kind of uh, different views, different formats, different methods that all serve their, their purposes. So this is, this is what we see, and this is something that, that creates the strength of science communication, that it kind of caters different uh, needs for different stakeholders. But on the, on the other hand, we can also talk about this as fragmentation that is more problematic, that we kind of don't have this center of gravity, that, that when we talk about science communication, uh, different uh, people in different countries or people working in different fields do not quite agree uh, what is science communication and why we are doing science communication. So this kind of uh, diversity of understandings and, you know, definitions of problems of why do we have to do science communication is also quite quite large. And, and we probably will have to discuss at, at what point does diversity become problematic when it becomes kind of fragmented. And, and we've, we found this kind of fragmentation in both the, the research of science communication, that kind of this kind of different ideas, different approaches, uh, and not having then this common, common framework or, or common kind of this reference point where all go, go back to, but also in, in practices as, as uh, the other uh, project also, also found. So yeah, I, I think this is one of the crucial issues for us to discuss. Do we want to kind of the center of gravity somewhere? And, uh, and to what extent do we perceive uh, diversity as a value. Thanks, Akko. I think that takes us very, I mean, you're, you're asking a question that I think we can continue to talk about. I, I mean, as you were speaking about this fragmentation, I was reminded of what Anna was saying about these very different contexts and thinking diversity can also mean inequity, right? You know, some places have a lot of resources um, maybe kind of a long history or set of traditions around science communication, and some places don't have those resources and those funding structures, uh, for instance. So we can also think about this as a, an equal landscape, as well as a, um, a diverse one. Um, yeah, perhaps then I would just invite reflections on this question. If we have such a diverse landscape, if we have a degree of fragmentation also in research, I think um, we see people using very different um, frames, um, perhaps not being aware of each other's work. Um, 
to what extent should we try and find, as, as you say, Arco, a kind of center of gravity, a, a collective experience or set of practices? Is this something, um, yeah, to be aimed for? Maybe I would ask um, Anna uh, to circle back to you if you have any reflections on that. Oh, I think that in a way we do. We have PCST, which is a, a sort of a center, a moral center of science communication. And at least in the cases I know in Portugal, a lot of our top communicators attend the conferences and are members and are involved. And I think this is a forum for, um, for exchanging uh, experiences and learning from from each other and I think that perhaps there's this lack of a more European centered association or network that could be more active on this there's the excite network uh, but it's quite exclusive to to science centers and museums and it's quite expensive to to be a, a member and to take part in their activities so I think that there's value in exchanging and having a forum for exchanging uh, practices and best practices and and research results about science communication. And, but at the same time, I think it's already a very internationalized field and that we draw a lot from what we see that is being done in other countries and there's strong communication, perhaps we should think of ways of reinforcing that communication and that exchange. But I think that at the same time, there will always be diversity because the scientific systems are a bit different. And I think that in our case, we are fortunate because science communication is highly regarded by the Ministry of Science. They show a very strong support to the national agency, which is sort of independent, but very close to the ministry. And there's uh, funding for some activities and the research community is very aware of the need to do science communication. It's enshrined in law. If we receive government money, we have to do science communication. It's mandatory, it's not optional. And so I think that we are very fortunate. And uh, Portugal has set an example a few years ago in 2001, I think, when there was this benchmarking exercise about science communication policies and practices. It was one of the examples that was highlighted. And I think that it's one of the few things in which we are not at the bottom of the list. And so it's re it's very comforting to know that. And But I do think that we should create more opportunities for sharing and what you said about inclusion and uh, in this case uh, inequality in the access to science communication that is something that needs to be combated because at the end of the day most of the times we're still preaching to the converted and there is a strong difficulty in bringing science to more marginalized groups of society and that is something that I, I haven't seen a magical way or magic bullet to solve that. But that is something that should concern us because even in countries where there's this vibrant science communication community, that still exists, this inequality of access to good science communication. Yes, and this is actually something I know came up in, in Quest as well, that even though we have this very um, diverse landscape um, across countries and also across formats, as, as Alko mentioned, you know, museum practice looks very different to, to science and social media. I think this was something that repeatedly came up, a concern about um, inclusion and science communication needing to reach different kinds of, of audiences. Brian, I wonder if we can now hear you. No, well, we hope that you can hear us um, and we're glad to, to have you here. I was going to ask you to comment because we've been talking about networking um, and about the PCST network, but if you still have no sound, I think, um, no. <laughs> 
Um, so Anna mentioned the PCST network, um, which Brian is a former president of. Again, I would encourage you to go and to Google that and to look at these um, the activities that PCST supports, um, which does have this kind of global um, look uh, at bringing together uh, science communication practice across the world. Um, Beata, uh, perhaps we, we turn to you in thinking about this question of the value or otherwise of this fragmentation. Um, is there a need for a kind of more coherent European science communication or is the value in the diversity? Um, I think if we go back to the question of how the European landscape looks like, I can think it's it's interesting to have like two distinctions uh, that we have, of course, a geographical Europe and different national contexts that uh, go along with, for instance, different systems of higher education and research and things like that, that, of course, also build a framework for different different um, uh, developments of science communication in the different countries. But of course, we also have this political level and um, I think that the Horizon 2020 framework and especially this, this um, science and society program, I think was a good first attempt to, to build some, some form of, of common and uh, common movement and give, give more momentum to the, to the entire field uh, and to also bring this uh, differences at least to the surface. Maybe if we can't, we can't bridge them at the moment or can't bridge them completely. And we also should have a look at how we bridge them. If it's, if it's some kind of colonial, colonial, colonialism that we also, uh, that we move from, uh, from the West to the East and say, hey, that's what you do, have to do. Or if we rather learn from those who are in their development now and rather have a look what, Maybe they do better uh, than we do, or how they how they find different ways to cope with the problems that we still have. As Anna mentioned, that we always preach to the converted, so maybe they find better ways to do that. So I think that we already took some first steps to to bring these fields together, closer together. And um, Anna mentioned PCST. I think there are many people who are also very eager to to uh, interact and to exchange, um, at least in the professional community. And I think um, that's a good good way forward from my perspective. It, it, Bankela, if you don't mind, perhaps we, we go back to you. Um, also in terms of how distinctive the, the kinds of dynamics that we've been talking about are uh, to Europe. So these, you know, these differences in resources, different practices, this diversity and fragmentation. Uh, I mean, when you um, listen to the kinds of things we've been discussing how distinctive is this ex european experience and how does it relate to um, what you see of the landscape of science communication in in south africa uh, it's if i look at it from the african perspective except for south africa where you have uh, specific training from where i am stellenbosch university in science communication uh, looking at science communication as a field of research, as a field of uh, study and practice, it's very rare in in Africa. In South Africa, we have uh, where I am in Stellenbosch, but apart from that, I, I don't know of any. In Ghana, there's a science and com, a science and health uh, a department, but it's the the focus is a little bit different. So even when it comes to surveys of public on the sign of science, the only one you will find is from South Africa, not from any other part of uh, Africa. Not that we don't do science communication, but it is embedded in the field of communication studies itself. So our focus has always been on local issues, uh, pollution in the Niger Delta, pollution in the mining communities of South Africa, a lot about health, about uh, malaria, combating malaria, combating communicable diseases. And then if you uh, uh, look again, uh, within the mass, most schools, we call it mass communication. Within there, you will have a little bit of specialization in environment communication, in health communication. It's really very rare. When I came into the field, I found I was almost alone, you know, and trying to figure out where to get the service, where to get the, so the funding is also not there. 
because of course there are probably different priorities, different things people want to do with money. But now over the last uh, five to 10 years, there's been a lot of awareness. People are now coming on board. People are seeing the, the need to have all these debates in the public. People want, uh, are seeing a lot of researchers are also coming on board. And uh, I think the, I want to think that the future is, is bright, but I must say we're a bit far from where Europe is at the moment. And uh, we'll try and catch up and maybe catch up gradually. Uh, but I still work a lot with uh, uh, Europeans. Uh, I still work, we have a lot of colleagues. There's still a lot of cross-cultural research, a lot of uh, collaboration. So I'm still, I would like to say I'm embedded in both fields, both uh, um, Europe and, and, and in Africa. But the, the, the local priorities here yeah, have made it slightly uh, different. And the institutional frameworks, the, the syllabuses, the courses, uh, we're beginning to change them gradually to recognize the need for specificity, the need for uh, more attention to specific fields. I, I think we'll, we'll get there. Can I just add something? It's because I have a student from Angola, which is quite close to South Africa, but it's a completely different situation. He attended our master course in science communication and he developed his thesis on science communication in Angola, which is a non-existent subject. And the bottom line is, if there is no research or barely any research, how can there be science communication? And so they have this legacy of a colonial legacy of a natural history museum. But other than that, it's a complete void. And it's, it's almost a non-thesis because, and I think that may be the situation in a lot of countries in Africa. So they need to have some sort of a scientific system before they can grow a science communication system or a science communication community. Thanks, Anna. I, I think it's also a really important point, that, um, uh, Bankala, that you make that um, the language of science communication is not always present. Um, so, Anna, as you say, um, if there is, we often look for things that are labeled science communication. Um, this is the language that, that we use, I think, in Europe a lot. Um, it already becomes a bit confusing when you translate to German. Um, because Wissenschaft has a slightly different um, set of connotations. Um, but many of much of this research, I think, and much, much practice is going on um, without being labeled um, science communication. So, so Bangala, the examples that you mentioned, this kind of rich tradition and histories of, of doing communication, um, perhaps not around environmental issues or um, other issues of local concern, but that's just not labeled and understood uh, in this particular, these partic particular terms. I think this also kind of emphasizes the value of the networking that we've been talking about, because I think, um, Bankala, from what you said, I think there are many practices and activities um, that are doing some form of communication or uh, engagement that it would be really valuable also um, for people in Europe to, to learn from. Um, so finding these, these opportunities to um, just discuss um, what is happening in different sites and to, to learn from each other and also I guess to support each other right to, um, uh, to, to enable building of structures or institutions um, it, it, this sounds like it's happening a bit over the last 10 years or so, um, Bankala, from what you've said, there is a, a growth in this. Yeah, when, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, when I wrote my thesis on vaccination resistance and religion, a lot of my colleagues in Europe were wondering what's the relationship between religion and science. And I said, I think there's a link uh, somewhere. Uh, it kinds of, uh, moderate uh, people's perspectives of, of uh, science. And what we even found then was that the more religious you are, the less you are likely to worry about science at all. You know, they, they, don't, they don't think it's a problem. So it's those who are somewhere in, in between being very religious and less religious, they're the ones that worry so much about, uh, about science. And we've seen this play out in the US with the uh, COVID vaccine. We've seen religion come out strongly, wrongly as well. In, in, things, but 
But these are things we've seen here over, over time. It, it even varies from one culture to the other. We are working on the Welcome Trust data now with colleagues in, in Europe, and we can see the Francophone countries in Africa having levels that are close to what you have in France, and the English-speaking countries having levels that are just as small as what you have in the UK. And we're trying to figure out what is responsible. Is it because they listen to Agency France Press and we listen to BBC, or what are the variables? These are things we want to look at. These are things we need to collaborate and look, look for uh, partners in France, look for people in, in the Francophone countries in Africa. What, what brings that similarity so close and completely different from if you look at Nigeria, where I am from, I'm in between two French-speaking countries. Uh, in fact, four, two on the left, on the, on the right, at the top, they are all French, and they have completely different view of vaccines than those of us in the middle. So there's, there's quite a lot of work uh, that, that's to be done. Yes, thank you. I think this takes us very neatly to, to one of the other topics I wanted to talk about, which is the fact that this landscape of science communication in Europe and elsewhere is not only diverse, but changing rapidly. And I guess particularly the last year and a half, I've seen you know, really big challenges for many science communication practitioners, um, a huge demand for science communication, um, but also financial pressures um, uh, on museums and science centers, uh, as, as well as many others. Um, so again, a general question. Um, how is this landscape of science communication changing? How has the pandemic impacted um, the kinds of dynamics that you've been talking about um, as being identified in these different projects? Maybe this time we go from north to south and start with Arco. Uh, I think as all of the projects, I think we did most of our field work before the pandemic. So, so we don't have actually the, the data to, uh, to to talk about, but from the personal sense, I think uh, of course the pandemic has brought science communication to the forefront. It has shown it to be like this crucial resource for the society to function. So that without it, the society just doesn't doesn't work. It has proved science communication to be that. Uh, however, it has also kind of uh, brought out the, the problems that. Uh, relate more uh, widely to, to science and, and communication. So I, I, would, I would say that in the field of science communication in this 30 or 40 years of existence has gone through several phases of thinking, what is science, what is communication, why do we do it? So it all started with public understanding of science. So promoting that people should understand, know the, know the facts, uh, that scientists should communicate more, and then it gradually uh, moved to uh, kind of this uh, dialogue and engagement approaches. And I think what we've seen in the past year and a half with this pandemic is that the whole society has gone through the same process in a, in a very quick way and uh, realized the same things that the science communication scholarship has, has realized maybe a decade ago or so, and, and learn some things the hard way. Uh, of course, the specialists were there to consult, but uh, but, but you know, for some things we have had to learn it, made the mistakes all over again to realize why are they important and how should we change the way we are we are doing things. So, uh, in a way, it has given more prominence to science communication. In another way, it has also shown that this is not the kind of quick solution. This is not the, the magic bullet to solve all of the issues and and you know the the things that are in the essence of science communication: the trust, uh, uh, inclusion. They all require time. They all require effort and resources and that you cannot just uh, uh, solve the vaccine hesitancy problem in, in two weeks or two months or two years. It's, it's, a, it's a very long societal process. And I, I think this realization has, has now been more widely uh, accepted. Thanks, Arko. I, I was actually talking with a colleague this morning about the 
I mean, you can say many things about um, the experience of the pandemic, right? But one of them is that it really forced um, science in the making to be made public with all its uncertainties and the way in which knowledge was changing on a day by day basis at, at some points. And this, I think, is one one of these things that you've mentioned that science communication has been saying for, for a while that we need to show um, that science is an uncertain and a slow and a, and a gradual process and we can't get away with just um, saying there are facts and um, kind of beaming these down from, from on high. Um, Beata, how has your experience been? Um, how has the pandemic changed your experience of science communication or, or, or what you've seen of science communication over the last years? Um, I think it's it's a bit dif difficult question because it's a, a kind of prognostic question because we're still in this crisis in a way. Um, and so from my perspective, so, I've, so we did, our colleagues of mine in, in the context of Rethink did a question, uh, did, a, um, did research on sense making and how people make sense of uh, COVID communication. Um, and this was quite, of course, it's only a snapshot. So it's no, no uh, representative survey or whatever. It's just a snapshot on how people used science and science communication. What turned out very strongly was that science communication actually had not a very strong impact on their decision-making and their everyday life, but it was rather um, colleagues, friends, all the other people who, who of course uh, had an influence on their opinion, on, uh, on their opinion uh, formation and things. And I think this was something interesting that we always uh, assume that science communication has become more and more important, but actually it has been, of course also uh, so it has been very present but on the other hand it has been also very politically present um, and therefore it was it was not so important as we thought uh, and I'm really curious and really wondering how um, this will this will uh, um, influence the development of science communication in general because from my perspective this is a very specific and narrow narrow uh, um, field of science communication that we are witnessing now that has gained an importance, which is basically health communication. Uh, and also, if we have a look at the experts that become uh, that or that are very visible, at least in the in the German speaking countries, as far as I can see, that are basically um, health uh, health experts. Um, and so, uh, I'm a bit more bit more pessimistic that this will last and that we will really uh, increase. Uh, or promote them or, or have, have a greater importance of science communication, a great acceptance of science communication, um, but rather think that this has been just a, a crisis, crisis phenomenon uh, and uh, that we'll go back to normal after a while in a way. Thanks, Beate. Anna, I'm curious about your kind of perspective from Portugal. Um, which I think is, you know, is a different place from Germany in, in many ways. Um, does that resonate, what Beta has been saying, particularly about this prominence of a, of a few key health experts? Has that also been the case in Portugal? Well, we had an epidemic of experts on media, quite frankly. And it was not always positive because we had virologists talking about epidemiology, mathematicians talking about virology, a lot of experts are overstepping their area of expertise and that is something that people don't quite like because we were fortunate we managed to do our consultations before the pandemic so we we have the data but we don't have the data about the pandemic but what we had about in the discussions about vaccination are really consonant with what actually happened in the vaccination process, because we have Portugal and Spain with hugely high rates of vaccination, almost 100% of the eligible population is vaccinated. And that is something we could have guessed from our results that would happen, because we have, in the peninsula, we have this really respect for authority, and especially health authorities and um, physicians, so there is no really resistance to vaccination in Portugal and Spain. The same does not happen in Italy, and that's why they also have lower rates, and across the rest of Europe it, it has been seen. But I think what is curious is that in 
all, most science communicators in Portugal say that science communication about the pandemic failed, that the government was unable to draw from the level, already high level of expertise in science and health communication that exists, and they messed up. They used uh, communication agencies that sell products. They don't sell, they don't give information about science. And so the strategy was quite criticized here by science communicators. That's the hour long press conferences every single day were not helpful for the population. And there were missed messages about masks, just like everywhere else in the world. And so a lot of mistakes were made in science communication about the pandemic, but they, they had little impact on people's behavior. Because as soon as, as it became mandatory to use masks, everybody was wearing masks. Now that is no longer mandatory, most people still wear masks. So there's this, this uh, precautionary principle that people are operating in, in this pandemic that I think it's typical from these two countries that are quite, uh, how shall I say, it's subservient to science. There is very little movement here of contestation about science and contestation about masks. There's a handful of people, they are very vocal on social media, but they have zero impact on the population. And so I think that the, the pandemic was a really interesting time to observe this and to, to check that science communication has a limited impact on how people behave in this case. And I think it was, it's not because of a good reason, it's because we have low levels of literacy and so people do not, do not have the skills or the inclination to question science. And so they tend to follow the advice. If the doctor says, I do it. And we also have doctors, unlike Italy, for instance, where we realized that there were a lot of doctors against vaccination, uh, that here the doctors are quite scientifically minded. And so they, they follow the advice from the health directorate. And so it was, it was a quite different situation. And that's why we managed to keep the pandemic more or less in check. And now where in all other countries, the numbers are rising again, they are rising here, but not in terms of death or even hospital admissions, because there's 95% of the population vaccinated. So I think we were a bit of a outliers during this pandemic and it was, a golden opportunity for science communication because you watched it on the streets. Everyone was discussing the medical side and the pandemic and the numbers and the figures and the epidemic. Everyone became a armchair epidemiologist overnight. But at the same time, communication did fail. Uh, luckily, without an impact. Thanks, Anna. That's really fascinating. Yes, Arco, I was curious if you had any reflections. Yeah, just a comment. Uh, this paradox, I, I think after this pandemic, we are really going to look at how much did actually science communication impact the situation. Because the situation in Estonia, if you look at the different surveys, like the latest Eurobarometer survey, you see that Estonia is at the very top on, on the way that how positively people think about scientists. So the trust levels towards scientists are, are very high. I mean, you know, almost the best, uh, best in Europe and kind of the expectation that scientists uh, are meaning well to the society and are, are good at communicating. These are also really, really high. At the same time, if we look at the behavior, our vaccination rate is not brilliant. It's not even very good. It's uh, uh, at currently maybe at 60% of eligible population or something like that. So I, I think the factors determining uh, behavior uh, are largely you know, somewhere else, not just you know, in the fields of, of science communication and, and trust towards science. So yeah, this is something that we must uh, untackle and, and understand why this paradox is taking place because a lot of the science communication activities around the globe are directed towards creating this trust towards scientists. And yet we see that 
in a place where there is a very high level of trust, we don't see the expected behavior. Better. Yeah, just to add to this um, from the German background, what was really interesting to see what was what also that um, we have like all our European countries, of course, some populist movements um, that are most um, importantly very right wing um, oriented. And what was really interesting and also um, um, difficult to see or, or dangerous to see was how they also now turn to science skeptics and science populists in a way and how how they also use science as a new target um, for their for their attacks and their aggression and that was uh, rather a uh, yeah, very dark side of this uh, development of the pandemic and the related science communication just to add this perspective can i just add something arco you cannot trust the latest results of eurobarometer I noticed that in some countries, like in Portugal, it was a web survey. So it is completely out of sync with a regular survey because it's done in a panel and people are used to reply to surveys all the time and they look for the information because I was astonished because Portugal always had the lowest levels of scientific literacy because they brought back those questions about uh, science uh, knowledge like trivial pursuit and whereas 10 years ago the population in Portugal had miserable results now we were at the top of Europe so it's completely untrustworthy the results of Eurobarometer I was absolutely appalled when I read them because I use them in my classes I use them all the time in my articles and suddenly they just didn't make any sense. And that's because they changed the methodology and they did it wrong. And so, and I'm really afraid because I think this is going to be used in some countries to say, so problem solved, people trust science. We have the survey that proves it. And I think it's, it's really not at all reliable, I'm sorry. Just yeah, comment, we had a local barometer survey as well with a different methodology that also showed high levels of trust. So it's not just the Eurobarometer, just a comment. I, I mean, I think both um, these comments on, on a specific piece of research um, that was carried out, but also more generally what you've been saying about your different context. Um, this is a very social scientist thing to say, but I think it shows that we need really good social research that looks at cultures the differences between cultures around science, national cultures, but also other kinds of cultures, and really engages with these complex ways that people make decisions and gain knowledge from different sources and negotiate uh, science and technology. I mean, everything that you've said shows that it's not a straightforward process. Uh, and it's not this kind of easy relation between science, scientific knowledge being provided through science communication and people taking that in and, and making choices. Um, Bankala, maybe we, we turn now to the, the African context. When you think about the last year and a half and the, the experience of the pandemic, um, how has that changed science communication and what maybe what successes or, or failures have there been? Well, the I don't want to use the word apocalypse that was expected that when COVID hits Africa, it's going to be very devastating because of the experiences we've had with, <clears throat> with Ebola and all the other ones. Uh, some, somehow, we, we are still have to figure out what is going on. It's not as bad as we thought. And despite the poor health systems, we're we not getting the infection rates and hospitalization rates that uh, we found uh, in Europe. People are associating this with maybe the endemic malaria, uh, the hot weather all year round, but we don't have any uh, people are even looking at uh, genetic predisposition and some other stuff, but we don't have the, the, the data yet. But it's not been as bad as we thought. There were a lot of preparations for, for, for the COVID and when it hit, except in South Africa, where it's really been very bad, in most parts of Africa, it's not been that bad. In Nigeria, for example, the infection rates are quite low. Uh, hospitalization and death is also very low. We also know that when we look at uh, cultures between 
Nigeria is my country, I work in South Africa, between the North and the South, we have two different cultures and their attitudes to science uh, vary at times. Uh, if I go back to the polio vaccine, the polio vaccine was accepted in the South maybe two decades before it was accepted in the North. So you, you get all these cultural differences even within the entity called uh, uh, Nigeria. So when the, uh, when the COVID came in, and usually it's always through the airports and the busiest airport was Lagos. So we expected it to hit Lagos first. And of course it hit Lagos first. And uh, it's all the tourists coming in and going out, a lot of screening, a lot of uh, that went on. On the science communication side, it, most of the people in charge are the doctors, the, the, the virologists. We didn't even have a clear distinction about who is a virologist or who is a doctor or who is an epidemiologist. They, they, had, they had the teams, but it was largely led by the civil servants, by the politicians. So the daily briefings and all that went on for a while. And then because the infection rates were not so high, it just tipped out. But in South Africa, it's been more active because they have a higher infection rates, probably also because they have a higher tourism potential, uh, a lot more tourists coming here from uh, the rest of the world. We don't know. There's still a lot of data we would like to get after the the pandemic, there's still so much we need to know to, to figure out all those differences you find across uh, Africa, why it's so different from Europe, why it's so different from, from the US, even within. Uh, it seems to spread more in the commercial and uh, political capitals of Nigeria than you find in the rural areas, uh, uh, Lagos, Abuja, and maybe Kano, and then you go to some other areas they don't even know that anything. So wearing of masks is not, People just don't think there's anything anywhere for them to wear a mask or to wash their hands. Or compared with South Africa, where to even get into a bus, you have to sanitize your hand. So you, you have all these differences uh, uh, going on across the continent. Mm. Yeah, and when you think about, I mean, so is there likely, do you think, to be long term impacts on science communication? I mean, has this. Um, triggered funding for science communication efforts or has it been kind of uh, I, I mean this way that the the doctors were were taking this on is this just going to be yeah normal and, and it's not seen as requiring anything uh, extra or special if, if anything it's no longer going to be business as usual uh, there's a lot more uh, emphasis now on health and the need to strengthen the local infrastructure and we can't do that also without strengthening the communication aspect of it. So uh, uh, a lot more people are now looking at not just the doctor telling you something, uh, what, how do you process what the doctor tells you? How do you process what the scientist tells you? It's becoming more obvious now that it's not just uh, if he, uh, somebody says something and he says it is science, then you have to take it. People are saying that at times science is not this is it and that is it, which we, a lot of people think that once the scientists say this, you must follow the science. So what happens when the science changes slightly? The public get a bit confused and then it changes again and then they get more confused and it's like, oh, we thought you were, you were science. So a lot of this we've experienced now, we need to figure out a lot more. I think I, I read an article by, I think, uh, Steve Miller of UCL a long time ago where he talked about public understanding of science at the crossroads. And those are the things he was talking about that the public need to get used to scientists arguing in public about methods, about things like that. And this is what has come up again today between the epidemiologists, the virologists, and the general practitioners who are much closer to the, to the public. They are the ones that you see, you see your local doctor all the time. You don't see the epidemiologist, you don't see the virologist who is standing there talking to you. So yeah, once he finishes his speech, you go and meet your doctor. Doctor, what, what do you think I should do? So the doctor tells you what to do. So we need to find a way of uh, bringing all these things together uh, on the table and, and say, saying that the doctor is probably much closer to, to the public, but these are things for us in science communication to sit and work out. Not so much that we need to do the talking, but to make all these observations and try and come up with some kind of policy initiative, some kind of policy framework that can make these kinds of conversation much better. If we, hopefully we won't have this kind of catastrophe again. 
Thanks, Bankola. That leads very nicely into the last thing I, I want to raise. Um, I, I thank you also for this image of the crossroads. I think this is a really useful one. Um, just so that everybody knows, I would like to finish by quarter past one. Um, I think people's tolerance for, for digital uh, encounters is, is limited these days. It's lunchtime for many of us in Central Europe. Um, so as a last kind of thing to reflect on, I, I wondered if I could ask everybody to think about this notion of the crossroads and the challenges um, or wish lists that you, you would have for science communication uh, in the future. I mean, so thinking about what's next, what we would like to do as a community. Um, yeah, how would you set an agenda or, or what would you like to see change or, or done differently? Beate, maybe I, I start with you, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I think uh, what what came out or was one one uh, consequence of the uh, pandemic in Germany was that everybody wanted to have more science communication and said, okay, every scientist now needs to be uh, present in the public and needs to do podcasts and needs to do children's universities and things like that. And, um, so um, and we also witnessed that there's a, some kind of increase in activity. Uh, within the scientific community, but also by universities and uh, organizations of higher, uh, higher education. Um, and also this is very strongly fostered by, by uh, politics. So they emphasize very much on science communication and more science communication and more engagement. And I think um, what has been very much discussed in the German context now is that we need to overcome this, this perspective and need to not, not to think about more science communication, but about better science communication. And this includes not only that we, that we as communicators or as researchers or as parts of the practice somehow reflect about this issue, what is good and what is not so good science communication, but that we also, um, yeah, um, exchange with our audiences about what they actually need, what is expected, what, uh, why they should contribute to science communication. If we, if we talk about public engagement uh, in the broadest sense um, and make them literate in a, in a very broad way. So not only science literate, but also strengthen their media competences and things. And so have this, this shift towards better science communication that, uh, that could hopefully be good for all parties involved in this enterprise. Thanks, Vieta. So yeah, not more, but better. Uh, and, and better at engaging with, with publics by the sound of it as well. Um, Arko, what would your be, agenda be? Um, I, I think instead of a crossroads, a, a pro more proper metaphor would be one of those American highway junctions where you have kind of dozens of roads crossing one another and the cars driving at a very high speed. So, so we have a lot of actors doing sense communication into society, but kind of the directions seem to be different. Then there isn't that much kind of, they're not on the same level of, of, of doing things. So I think one of the challenges would actually make them uh, talk to each other more, to understand each other more, kind of set common, common goals and then work out uh, common kind of, uh, approaches or common goals of, of what do we want to do. And, and this is something that, that we kind of a bit tried in the, in the Quest project. So one of these uh, um, central things that we try to do is, is get those people around one table and, and think about what is, what is quality science communication. And, and we saw that kind of this, discussion, this co-creation was really worthwhile and everyone appreciated that to kind of uh, take in those different perspectives and try to put those together into some kind of coherent map or coherent understanding of, of, of something. So, so I, I think this is, this is something that, that we need to do more. And uh, one example of why do we need to do that more also, uh, we collected uh, from people input, we asked them to send us examples of quality science communication. And one of the most striking things that we found from this kind of set of examples, so everybody could write up to three examples, is that 
whereas in science communication literature and also increasingly in practice, we talk a lot about uh, engagement and inclusive formats like uh, citizen science, etc. There were no good examples that people sent in representing those those formats. So I think this represents some kind of a issue that uh, there's some kind of discrepancy in this field between research and practice or between practice and expectations or wherever. So, so there's still a lot of kind of gaps uh, to overcome and, and bridges to build and, and things to talk about. Thanks, Akko. I think the, the highway image is going to stay with me, this kind of spaghetti junction where people are going in different directions um, with different aims in mind um, and maybe don't even know about the other people on the on the road uh, also. Uh, Anna, what would your manifesto or agenda be? Well, first, I have to, to agree with Arco because we reached the same conclusion, because when we ask people to make suggestions on how to improve science communication, most of their suggestions were aimed at traditional forms of science communication that are very much connected to a deficit model of science communication, a top-down communication. And that is because most people have no contact with engagement practices, with engagement activities, with other kinds of activities related to science. And maybe the reason is like a colleague of mine calls it gourmet science communication, these engagement practices, because they work in very small groups for very small groups. And I think the challenge for us would be how to scale up this gourmet science communication, how to improve it in a way that involves more people and provides the opportunity to people to experience a relation with science in a different way. In our case, we, we, we had slightly different results because we, we, our sample came from people that had already participated in some of the activities we did, like a, a very big project on climate change adaptation. And so those people who had experienced these sort of engagement activities with science that's what they recommended, more contacts, more participation, more involvement of citizens, better communication from citizens to scientists. So I, we know that when people experience these, these, these activities, these engagement activities, they like it and they want more of it. But the challenge is how do we provide them the opportunities to participate? And that's my manifesto or it's my agenda for what I would really like to achieve working in this area. Thanks again, a really nice image of the gourmet science communication being scaled up and made accessible and more part of mundane culture, I suppose, something that we are all used to, to experiencing and, and doing. Bankala, I think you get the last word. You already spoke a little bit about the need for um, yeah, people may be uh, in public to have a sense of um, the realities of how science works, um, the kind of this, that it's slow and um, uh, uncertain, but what other kinds of, um, what other things would you like to promote or um, suggest as a way forward for science communication? Yeah, I, I, I also want to, to look at the, the COVID thing as a super highway because of the speed at which things were happening, things were happening so fast. And unfortunately, the politicians were the ones controlling the traffic lights and they were determining which direction we go and which direction we didn't go. And at the end, to make things bad, then they started telling you which signs to follow and which signs not to follow. And then when they say follow this today and tomorrow it changes, and then they jump to the other one. I think there must be a way we can do a lot more talking to our politicians. I think we should start directing a lot of science communication to the politicians that this is the way it works. They shouldn't take sides and then the public get confused. And, you know, the, the way, well, the level of trust in politicians is probably not as high as what you have in, in scientists where, when we do our public opinion surveys. But we also need to look at this concept of actors. And, and look at the concept of actors, the different types of actors, the scientists, the politicians in particular, 
and try and get a lot more. It's easy for us to assume that they don't need to know about uh, science communication and, and then we leave them. And then when issues like this come up, they are the main actors and we are not even referred to uh, to come on board. So we need to reach out to them, not just to reach out to the public, we need to reach out to the main actors, the scientists and the politicians as well. Yeah, thank you. So again, when we think about best practice in science communication, we need to make sure that it's reaching policymakers and politicians and other high profile figures as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for those last comments. I really enjoyed the, the different sets of images that we have, the, the highway and the, um, uh, the gourmet uh, forms of science communication. Um, and I think it's a nice aid memoir to, to help us think about what to, to push or what to promote in science communication, research uh, and practice. Thank you so much to all of you, the panelists, um, for such a great discussion. Thank you, Brian, for organizing. Um, I'm so sorry we didn't get to, to hear more from you. Uh, for everybody listening, I really encourage you to look at the, the websites of the projects that we have mentioned, um, or indeed to look at the research profiles of everybody uh, on the panel if you want to engage more with their work. Uh, thanks again to the panelists, um, to the European Science Festival for organizing this, and for everyone who is watching. We trust and believe that you are, are there uh, and hope that you've had a good hour. Uh, yeah, thank you and enjoy the rest of the festival.